Hey everyone, welcome to r slash Tales from Tech Support, where we get to have a little chuckle at the technologically disadvantaged, like me. I'm Uncle Reddit, and have I got a story for you. I need read-only SSH access to the admin user. So I support middleware infra and a pre-DevOps support model at an enterprise-scale corporation. We have automation that manages application teams, SSH, and web console access for prod app servers. Is that production or product? Anyway, as one reasonably should, such that their RSA keys are only present on the server during the scheduled change windows, and they can't just hop on whenever they want and mess around with things they shouldn't. We've recently onboarded a new team to this service, where previously they had managed their own app servers. I've shown them how to use our access automation and set them up with everything they need to succeed. Or so I thought. This last week, one of their engineers opens a request to give them read-only access to the prod servers. I initially take this to mean read-only access to the app server web console, which I confirm has already been done. So I asked him to clarify what he means by this. Maybe he's having trouble getting into the console or something, and I can give him some documentation to help him out. No, he has read-only access to the web console just fine. He wants read-only access to the admin user ID on Linux. He insists that they had this kind of access control on their old servers and it's not working on the new server. I explain why this isn't how user IDs work and suggest that maybe what he's looking for is to add a separate service account to these servers for his team and set permissions on all relevant directories so that user ID can read them. Nope, that's not what he wants. He wants read-only access to the admin user ID. He wants all of his teammates to be able to log into that user ID whenever they want and have read-only access to all files for that application server. He insists that he's logged into the server with the admin user ID and had permission denied errors for files that the admin user ID owns, and in fact writes to. And he needs the admin user ID to be given read-only access to those files for all of his teammates. At this point, I've given up explaining that this is not how Unix user IDs work, and I'm feeling honestly a bit uneasy about the fact that this is an engineer who is responsible for installing and managing prod upgrades to their app server, so I decided to change tracks. Okay, can you please show me a screenshot of when this issue last occurred or give me the path of the files you believe the admin user doesn't have access to? Now, I have no reason to believe the admin user is missing any of the required accesses. My team builds out all the directories in a contained directory structure owned by the admin user, and we have pretty strict access management controls in place. The intent here is to get him to show me how he came to the faulty conclusion to begin with, of course. His response is, sure, I'm a bit busy, but I'll show you later. It's been a few days now and I haven't heard back yet. Not holding my breath for a satisfying conclusion on this, because usually what will happen with these things is that he'll do a bit of reading or consulting with his senior teammates, and figure out on his own that the issue he's running into is something completely unrelated. But admittedly, a part of me is actually kind of invested now in finding out exactly what the actual issue is that this guy has misconstrued as we need read-only access to the admin Linux user ID. Okay, I have absolutely no idea what most of that stuff means. Uh, I mean, I sort of get the gist, but if any of you guys can dumb this down for me a little bit, let me know in the comments down below. Every Friday at midnight, the alarms went off, even when the building was empty. Customer was furious. We'd installed a feature-rich, mixed security system, integrated alarm, access, and cameras. And every Friday, like clockwork, the system went crazy and there was never anything wrong. After several weeks of this and more than one false 911 call, they were furious. I opted to head out the next day and visit them on Saturday morning. First thing I do is walk in and speak with the administrator for a while since I'm early. She's busy compiling a bunch of fax receipts and reports from their big industrial printer. She tells me that these reports are all spit out at midnight on Fridays. Heat activated motion detector covering the foyer was picking up the hot paper and exhaust fans from the printer. I got up on a ladder and bent the detector mount a bit. It never false alarmed again. Yeah, I don't know that there's anyone really to blame here. Um, you know, the people having the alarm system installed really don't know anything about alarms. Unless the equipment, like the printer, were in place before the alarm system was put in, I'm not sure the techs would have known about it. Uh, if the equipment was there, I think they would have questioned that if there was heat sensing and things like that. So, I don't know. 
Opening your mouth just means getting more work. I'm Dave. I've been asked to take over reporting duties for someone I'll call Sue, who is going on an extended leave. About two months, probably. And she may not even come back. Last week we met and reviewed her process. The first 10 minutes was spent in confusion by me asking her which tables she queried, what criteria she used, and what time she kicked off the query, etc. Sue doesn't do anything like that. She watches for emails that have a certain phrase in the subject line. She adds the ticket number listed in those emails to a spreadsheet that she keeps open all day. She tracks each ticket's progress based upon more emails. She tries to make sure it still qualifies for the report. Depending upon the emails, she may remove tickets from her spreadsheet. At a certain time every day, she grabs a list of qualifying tickets from the spreadsheet and opens our ticketing application. She browses to each ticket and verifies the information is still current. She copies and pastes the information from various sections of the ticket into an email. Repeat steps 4 and 5 for each ticket. She formats the information and adds some boilerplate language for each ticket in the email. She sends the email to a coworker who manually reviews it for errors. There's normally at least one. She sends the result to our manager who gives it a brief once-over and then sends it to the CEO of our Fortune 500 company. As I was hearing this, on mute, I said to myself two things. First, life is short and full of wonders. Second, I'm not doing that. I listened to Sue for the first 10 minutes of her explanation and then ignored her. I focused on developing my own method. I'm a little embarrassed by that, but it's starting to become a habit. I couldn't do this before I started working from home, and one day it'll get me into trouble. Anyway, I created a report that will capture all the relevant information, filtered by criteria that will pick out only the relevant tickets. I then manually prune some of the rows and feed the rest into a template that formats and presents all of the ticket's details. All I have to do is copy and paste the result into the email and convert it from table to text. Creating this took about an afternoon. My process from when I run my report until I'm ready to send is about 10 minutes. I think I can embed the report into the template. If I do that and delegate the printing to a macro, the time will be only 5 minutes. I think Sue was spending 2 hours a day on this at least. In terms of results, my process is a lot less fallible. So far the coworker who does the review has found no errors, only little formatting nits that I corrected in the template. I predict that our manager will eventually deem her participation unnecessary, so that's about another 30 minutes saved. Today I had this exchange with a colleague I'll call Stan. We've worked together for many years. Me. I can't believe that someone in our company was using such an absurd report generation process, especially for something that goes to the top. It still blows my mind. Stan. Dave, you know that group is infamous for this sort of thing. Or should I say your group? Dave. Don't lump me in with the rest of the people here. You know we had that reorganization. This has only been my group for a few months. Stan. Whatever. So what did Sue say when you showed her the report in the template? Dave, I haven't showed it to her yet. We both report to Chuck now. It occurred to me that she will probably show it to him, and if she does, he'll become aware that what took her two plus hours now takes me five to ten minutes. I think he'll cheerfully praise me and then send me more work. Stan, probably. Dave, I've never done this before, but I'm thinking of keeping this to myself and telling no one. Stan bursts out laughing. Dave, the real tragedy is that it took you 25 years to figure that out. Always, always keep your mouth shut. Yeah, sometimes improving processes and making things better for the company actually makes things worse for you. If you let them know, that is. Where did these 200,000 files come from? I do tech support for doctor's offices. And I specialize in interfaces. This would, for instance, be sending orders for labs and then receiving back the lab results. Another tech asked me to join a call because she's having a bit of a hard time understanding what she's seeing. I joined the call and the screen share. Other tech. Thanks for joining, Santa Thieves. We're finding that there are over 200,000 files in the out folder. Me. Oh. Okay. Well, let's check that out. I start looking through the files. So it looks like these files date back as far as 2019. And just spot checking a few of these, I see that they're intended for a destination called third party. Customer. We stopped using third party three years ago. Why are these files still here? Me. Well, the most recent date is from today. You've been trying to send these files since 2019 until today. What happens is that our software will write the file to the out folder and then send it over the socket. If the other side of the interface isn't accepting the connection for whatever reason, we'll report an error and the file will just stay in out. If they'd been sent over the socket, we'd put, I pull up the interface settings, 
our copy of the file in this archive folder you have specified here. I noticed that the interface is turned off on your side. When did you turn this off? Customer. Oh, we were troubleshooting something earlier today and turned it off then, but we haven't used third party for three years. Why are the files here? Me, because you've had the interface running all this time. You may have stopped using that company, but you never told the software to stop trying to send files, and it's been failing to send for three years. It looks like whoever's supposed to be monitoring the activity and error logs have been ignoring this for years. This would have been logged in the same place where you would correct other errors, like files that come in but couldn't find the correct patient. Those errors are normally resolved on a daily basis, and these connection errors would be seen then. Customer. So what do we do with these files? Me. You can delete them. You haven't wanted to send them for three years, so there's no reason to keep them. And now that your side of the interface is turned off, you shouldn't see any more being created. That sounds to me like that customer's office had somebody in charge of this kind of stuff, and then they either stopped doing it themselves, or they left or got fired or something, and nobody ever took it over for them. Client requests specific functionality, forgets what they asked for, again, and again, and again. I'm a web developer, and I have a lot of clients who are just the worst at reading comprehension. Or maybe it's a communication breakdown, since there were like five people on the client team, and each communication below was with a different team member. And even though every person on the team was involved in the initial conversation, and every subsequent email, each person had to be explicitly reminded at least once how the functionality we agreed upon worked. Four weeks ago, client, we need to be able to flexibly set the URL on the button that brings the users back to our app on the success page. Me, I'll code it to look for a query parameter called redirect URL on the landing page and use that to set the button. You just need to include that parameter in the link to the landing page. Client, okay. Three weeks ago, client, We've tested the app and it all looks good except the button on the success page doesn't do anything. Is this expected? Me. Did you include the redirect URL on the landing page? Per our previous discussion, you need to include this to set the button. You can put in any URL you want for testing purposes like redirect URL equals google.com. Client. Oh, got it. Okay, looks good. Two weeks ago. Client, hey, we've confirmed just about everything for the launch. Only issue is the button on the success page doesn't do anything. Me, per my previous email, one week ago. Client, we're not sure how to test the button on the success page that returns users to the app. Can you confirm that this is not possible to test this? Me, no, you can test it. The link in your app that goes to the landing page needs to include the redirect URL. If you're testing in a browser and not coming from the app, you just need to add the redirect URL to the landing page, URL in the browser, e.g. site.com slash app redirect URL equals google.com. Client. Oh, okay, thanks. The day after launch. Client. I tested everything that looks good, except the button on the success page doesn't return me to the app. That's called too many hands in the pot. There should be one main contact dealing with all of this on their end. Client gets multiple parties involved and drags a ticket out for days, all because she didn't have her device plugged in. I work in hardware and software support for a company that makes medical equipment and distributes to hospitals. I got a support ticket Monday from someone who works in the IT department for a network of regional hospitals. A doctor had shipped him one of our devices from an hour away, requesting he reach out to us on her behalf to fix it. The only word she included in her email to him was broken. That's it. Literally nothing else. I requested that the IT guy, who was the only person I'd actually spoken to at that point, contact the doctor to get some more information. To which he told me, trust me, we will both regret doing that. And then told me how much of a nightmare this doctor is to work with. I told him we had no choice because I can't send a device in for repair with absolutely no information. So he calls her, puts her on speaker, and after he explained I had some questions about the device, she immediately started yelling. I was listening to her second hand through the speaker of that guy's cell phone into his work phone's microphone and then out through my headset earpiece. Needless to say, her yelling was almost unintelligible. After she stopped yelling and I could get a word in, I asked her what the specific problem was and she again went on another tirade, except I heard her say the device wasn't connecting to the software properly. I sighed to myself because I knew more problems are going to arise from here. I tell her due to it being a connectivity issue, there are several troubleshooting steps we need to take before determining that repair service is needed. 
She then just cursed once more and says, I don't have time for this, and hung up. It's silent for a few seconds, and then the IT guy goes, real treat, isn't she? And asks what we can do from here. I ask him if it's at all possible for him to get access to the specific terminal she was using so we can troubleshoot, and of course he says no, due to him working at central office for the entire network of hospitals, an hour away from where she was calling from. I tell him the only option is to send it back to her and tell her to call our support line directly so we can investigate the problem with her. Again, he reminds me that that will only make things worse. A few days pass and I'm hoping and praying that I'm not the unfortunate soul to get the call from her when she finally calls in, begging the gods to inspire her to submit her ticket via email so I can talk to her that way. But no, bright and early Thursday morning, my very first ticket of the day, I get the phone call from her. This is vaguely how it went. Me. This is Hungry Hungry Hippo from Indescript Medical Company. How can I help you? Dr. Witch. After a few seconds of silence, she finally speaks in the most witchy, condescending tone you can imagine. You told me to call you, so I assume you know what this is about. Me. Are you calling regarding an existing ticket? I didn't know who I was talking to at this point. We get hundreds of tickets a day. She then rattles off the ticket number as fast as she possibly could. I had to ask her to repeat it slower. She sighs and repeats the ticket number, except this time as slow as she could, obviously mocking me, which I just ignored. I pull up the ticket, realize who I'm talking to, and my heart sinks. Me. Oh, I see. You are having connectivity issues. If you could just... And she cuts me off. Dr. Witch. How long is this going to take? Calling you for help is always an effing nightmare. Me. Well, if you'll let me diagnose the problem, I can get you on your way. I remote into her computer and check a few things. The device isn't showing up in the device manager. It connects via USB. I ask her if it's currently plugged in, and in her signature witchy tone, she says, Yes. So I ask if she can try a different USB port. She asks, Do you mean one of the ports on the computer? And then I instantly knew what the problem was. I ask her if she was connecting to a USB hub, and if yes, to make sure the USB hub was connected to the computer. Sure enough, it wasn't. She was blowing a gasket over her device, not even being plugged in. She plugged the hub in and the device was recognized instantly. Of course, she didn't apologize for her behavior or anything. She just said, it's working now, and hung up. And I closed the ticket. And to put the icing on the cake, she gave me a 0 out of 5 satisfaction rating. What a witch. That's a darn shame when people look down on people like that and treat them like crap. I would say that, you know, it's a PhD slash I'm a doctor thing, you know, I knew better than you, but honestly, she was probably that way from birth. Hey guys, thanks for hanging out with me today. If you've enjoyed this content, would you do me a favor? Would you consider giving this video a like, subscribe to the channel, and maybe click that little bell icon so you don't miss the fat guy with the beard telling you stories. See ya!